Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our 25th Data Bytes, getting things done with data in government. I'm Gavin Freegard, Associate at the Institute for Government, and it's wonderful to welcome you all this evening. Let's start in the traditional Data Bytes way. Hands up if you've been to Data Bytes before. Welcome back. And hands up if this is your first Data Bytes. Welcome. This has been a big week for events at the IFG, with Labour's deputy leader Angela Rayner speaking on Monday as a reshuffle got underway. I should stress I'm not expecting any reshuffles to kick off during this event, but that's probably what Angela Rayner thought as well. Reshuffles are all about uncertainty, but there's a reassuring stability to Databytes. This is our 25th event. The fact we've already done 24 means that on this first day of Advent, you could make your very own Databytes Advent calendar. I know you'll love tonight's pre-Christmas cracker, stuffed as it is with four Christmas presents in presentation form. No turkeys, none of them having a myrrh, all of them slaying it. And in the great tradition of Christmas TV, yes, most of that was a repeat from last year. As is the usual virtual housekeeping. Tonight's event is on the record and we're being live streamed, obviously. If you'd like to get involved on social media, the hashtag is IFG Databytes, and we're live tweeting from at IFG Events. And if you want to put questions to our excellent speakers this evening, you can do so using the Slido page you're almost certainly already on. If not, go to bit.ly slash slidodb25. Why do we organise Databytes? Well, we want to bring together the different data communities in and around government. We want to show people what better data can mean in practice. And we want to put interesting data projects on the record for us all to learn from. That's the why, now the how. You're going to be treated to four presentations about data this evening. Each presentation will last for eight minutes. There are eight bits in a byte, hence eight minutes in a data byte. The presenters will then face questions for eight minutes. And then we move on to the next presentation. So four presentations of eight minutes, each followed by questions for eight minutes. And you can watch the previous 24 events, including last month's on the IFG website. In the grand tradition of data bytes, you're probably expecting some funny charts and terrible jokes about what's happened over the last month. Perhaps you're expecting me to pepper my presentation with references to the Prime Minister's speech to the CBI near Newcastle, a speech where at one point the Prime Minister lost his train of thought, a train that presumably lost its way before Leeds, never mind Newcastle. Or maybe you saw that story about people trapped in a pub with an Oasis tribute band, and you're starting to wonder where all the bad puns are going to come from. But actually, between the cold weather, the Omicron variant and everything else, I think you've already suffered enough this month. So instead, as threatened at last month's data bites, we're going to have a Christmas quiz instead, or at least try to. Eight questions, obviously, drawn from data bites this year, with five during this introduction and three coming later during the event. You should soon be able to see the quiz on the poll tab on Slido. It's multiple choice and you'll have 25 seconds from when I start to ask the question. These questions, like life, are going to come at you fast. Do enter your name, though if the audience Q&A at previous Databytes is anything to go by, I predict a very strong showing for Anonymous. Will you show yourselves to have as little knowledge as Angela Rayner's aides say Angela Rayner had of the Labour reshuffle, or as much knowledge as Keir Starmer's aides say Angela Rayner had of the Labour reshuffle? Let's find out. Question one. What is this chart from Whitehall Monitor 2021 showing? Is it A, the passage of legislation through Parliament? B, SAGE meetings and when their minutes were published? C, the start and end of particular COVID regulations? Or D, the time taken to answer freedom of information requests? Your time is rapidly running out. I said these are going to come at you fast. The correct answer is B. SAGE meetings and when their minutes were published. Question two. This chart shows chancellors of the Exchequer, the length of their budget speeches and what they were drinking at the time. But which chancellor was fortified by Sherry for nearly five hours? A. Lloyd George, B. Asquith, C. Gladstone or D. Pitt the Younger? Log your answers now. You've not got much time left. The correct answer is C, Gladstone, Prime Minister four times and his own Chancellor twice. No wonder he needed a drink. Question three, what's this chart showing? 
Is it A, the number of French presidents serving prison terms for corruption? B, the number of boats blocking the Suez Canal? C, the number of Piers Morgans storming off Good Morning Britain? Or D, the number of European football super leagues in existence? Register your answer now. There's not much time left. This is going very, very quickly, isn't it? The correct answer for this question is, of course, B, the number of boats blocking the Suez Canal. Has a block chip ever given us such joy? Question four, what is this a detail from? Is it A, sequencing of the Delta COVID variant? B, the first NFT artwork bought by government? C, polls for the Hartlepool by-election? Or D, the composition of the Welsh Senev? Do log your answer now. Your time is rapidly coming to an end. And the correct answer on this one is D, the composition of the Senev. And the last question during this introduction, question five. This chart is about the England men's football team, but does it show A, all England tournament matches, uh, major tournaments that have involved Gareth Southgate, B, wins, draws and losses in major tournaments, C, penalty shootouts won and lost, or D, share of tournament goals scored by Harry Kane and Alan Shearer. This is where we find out if you're on the ball or paying the penalty for not watching Data Bytes earlier this year. The correct answer on this one is A, 36% of all England's matches at major tournaments have involved Gareth Southgate. Those are the first five questions of tonight's quiz. Keep watching for the final three. But the main reason to keep watching is, of course, tonight's speakers. First this evening is Natalia Domagala from the Central Digital and Data Office on algorithmic transparency. Government launched its new standard just this week. Then we'll hear from Henry Dukeman from the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy on the use of real-time indicators to monitor the economy. Our third presentation comes from Ben Henschel and Mallory Duran, government data scientists based at number 10, talking about their personal experiences of dashboard speaking truth to power across government. And our final presentation of the evening, our 100th Databytes presentation overall, comes from Michael Birtwistle from the Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation, the first person to make a third Databytes appearance on the second iteration of the AI Barometer. Databytes will return after our winter break on the 2nd of February 2022, and then on the first Wednesday of each month through to July before our summer break. That assumes, of course, we continue to find partners willing to support Databytes. We don't get to run them without sponsors very often. Would you like your organisation's name up in lights? If so, please get in touch with my colleague, Pratesh. And we are, of course, looking for speakers for next year's events. If you might be interested or know someone who should be, please get in touch with me. We'll be holding some virtual drinks, as ever, after tonight's event. We'll put these up again at the end. Link is bit.ly slash db25drinks, password ifgdb25. Remember, you can ask questions of our speakers this evening on Slido. Make sure you switch from the polls tab where the quiz is back to the Q&A tab where the Q&A is. So without any further ado, let's hear from our first speaker this evening. Natalia, over to you. Thank you very much, Gavin. Can everyone see my screen? We can indeed. We've got the um, we've got the bar at the top, but we can see your slides. Um, okay. I suppose that's the best we can get. So, sorry, but uh, welcome everyone. It's an honour to be here with you today, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation, Gavin. My name is Natalia de Magala. I'm the head of data ethics at the Central Digital and Data Office. And uh, today I will talk you through the process of developing our algorithmic transparency standards. We launched the very first version of the standard on Monday and we have worked on it with the Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation. And before I begin, I'd like to say a huge thank you to my CDI colleagues. So algorithmic transparency is about communicating clearly how decisions that affect members of the public are reached and what role algorithmic tools play in the process. Now, why algorithmic transparency matters? Well, because the public has a democratic right to information and explanation about how the government operates and how it makes decisions. The public also has data rights under the UK GDPR. Opening algorithmic assisted decisions up to scrutiny helps build, build and maintain public trust in government. Algorithmic transparency also provides an opportunity for government departments to highlight good practice around the use of algorithmic tools. 
It also facilitates learning, and this is both within and across government departments. It contributes to improvements in the development, design, and deployment of algorithmic tools across the broader public sector. Finally, algorithmic transparency enables those who build, deploy, use, or regulate algorithmic tools to identify any problems with a given tool early on and potentially limit future negative impacts. And the need for greater transparency on the use of algorithms in the public sector and also the need to standardize this information have been continuously flagged and recommended by a number of bodies and organizations. And the full list is much longer than what you can see here, but here are just a few organizations that have called for that in the UK. We recognized and responded to these calls through our commitments, first in the National Data Strategy in September 2020, and then we reiterated this commitment in the National AI Strategy, where we specified that we are working towards developing a cross-government standard for algorithmic transparency. Now, let me explain the process of developing the standards. So we began with a series of workshops with external experts. And during those workshops, we asked what information on the use of algorithms should be included in the transparency, uh, the algorithmic transparency mechanism. How should this information on the use of algorithms be presented? How often it should be updated? And which algorithms should be in scope? We then consulted those findings with colleagues from across the government and we asked them similar questions. Finally, jointly with the Center for Data Ethics and Innovation, we commissioned deliberative research, and that was with an aim to consider how the public sector can be meaningfully transparent about algorithmic decision-making. And the core objectives of that research were to explore what kind of algorithmic transparency measures would be most effective at increasing public trust and public understanding about the use of algorithms in the public sector. Based on all these research exercises, we developed the standards to help public sector bodies in the UK share information on the use of algorithmic tools with the general public. And public sector bodies can provide this information by filling out a set template and publishing it on gov.uk. The template is available on gov.uk as well. It's downloadable and ready to fill out. And in terms of applicability, in the initial phase of this work, we'll prioritize tools that either engage directly with the public, for example, chatbots, or tools that meet at least one criteria in each of the three categories. So the first category is technical specifications, and this includes tools that are that include complex statistical analysis, complex data analytics, or machine learning. The second category is potential public effects, so tools that have a potential legal, economic, or any similar impact on individuals or populations, tools that affect procedural or substantive rights, or eligibility, receipt, or denial of a program. And finally, impact on decisions. So tools that replace human decision-making or assist or add to human decision-making, for example, provide evidence for decisions. And going forward, we'll be working with the Data Standards Authority to help us roll out the standard cross government in the future. For now, the Central Digital Data Office will support the implementation of the standard. Now, let me tell you a little bit more about the standard itself. So it has two tiers and in tier one, um, you should give a basic description about how the algorithmic tool functions and why it was introduced into the decision process. And this can include things like what problem the algorithmic tool is aiming to solve and how it's solving this problem and also what is the rationale for using it. And tier one is geared towards the general public so that interested individuals can learn about the tool and know where and how to find additional information. It's supposed to be really short, really accessible, written in plain English. Tier two provides more detailed information about the algorithmic tool. And this is directed at slightly more interested and informed parties. This could be civil society organizations, journalists, academics, and um, members of the public that are really interested in learning about algorithmic tools. And now I will talk you through each of the sections of tier two. So in the owner and responsibility section, you should detail accountability for the deployment of the tool. And this includes information about the organization, team responsible for the tool, senior responsible owner, any external suppliers, their company's house number, and the role of those external suppliers, as well as terms of their access to any government data. The second section is a detailed description of the tool. So this includes answering questions like why, what, what has this tool been designed for and what it hasn't been intended for. So common misconceptions should be listed here as well. Then we have an expanded justification section that includes a list of key benefits. So for example, value for money, efficiency, ease for individual, and the list of non-algorithmic alternatives considered. In the technical specification section, we have a type of the model, how regularly is the tool used, uh, what, is the, what is its phase, uh, what is the maintenance schedule, 
and system architecture. Then we have information on the decision and human oversight. So what is the wider policy decision process? How is the tool integrated into that process? And what influence does the tool have on the decision-making process? Uh, human oversight section is all about how, uh, how much and what information the tool provides to the decision maker. Where is the human in this process? And is there any required training that those using and deploying the tool need to undertake? And finally, information about available mechanisms for review and appeal of the decision. Then we've got a section focused on data. So in this section, we're looking at data sets used to train the model and the data sets that, will be, that the model is or will be deployed on. And this includes the name of the data set, overview of the data, uh, URL for the data sets if they are available online, information data collection process, including the original purpose of data collection, information on the data sharing agreements in place, and details on who, ha or on who has and will have access to this data. And finally, the last section, is all about uh, risks and mitigations. So first we have a list of all the impact assessments that have been conducted, including links to those assessments. And this could be anything starting from the data protection impact assessments um, to any other relevant assessments. Then a section on risks and mitigations is a detailed description of common risks for the tool and the detailed description of how those risks have been mitigated. Uh, as this is a standard, we also developed a schema to support teams working through it. And this is to make sure that the data on the use of algorithmic tools is consistent and of high quality. In terms of the next steps, the released version of the standard is the very first version we have developed. And during the upcoming pilot phase, we'll gather learnings and feedback from project teams that are willing to trial out the standard. And based on, on these insights, we'll refine and iterate it further. We are also currently finalizing our fifth national action plan for open government and one of the working groups set up to deliberate on the next set of commitments has been focusing on open algorithms. So jointly with representatives from civil society, we developed a draft of a commitment exploring actions that would increase accountability of decisions made with algorithmic tools. And we are planning to continue to engage with civil society and develop the next steps for this work beyond that, that initial uh, working group. And, um, Finally, publication of the standard comes after the government consulted on a proposal to introduce transparency reporting on public sector use of algorithms in decision making. And this was as a part of a DCMS run data and new direction consultation. So we are currently analyzing the feedback. And I think I'm out of time. So that's it from me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Natalia, and uh, congratulations on the launch this week. Um, just a reminder that it doesn't look like you need a reminder, everybody, um, that you can ask Natalia questions via uh, Slido. We've got loads coming in, so apologies in advance uh, to those of you whose questions I don't get to. So, Natalia, the first question um, is from Anonymous. Good evening to you, Anonymous. How did the public engagement inform the design of the algorithmic transparency standard? What did you learn from members of the public? Great, that's an excellent question. So, um, so the public engagement part was actually really, really key for this work. So uh, jointly with the Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation, we commissioned a research consultancy called Britain Thinks to run a deliberative study. And, um, and this study span across three weeks and we were asking members of the public from all over the UK, um, members of the public, different age, gender, ethnicity, socioeconomic group, uh, also different levels of trust in institutions, different levels of digital literacy. And we essentially asked them what kind of algorithmic transparency measures they would like to see from the government. And during this three week process, we gradually build up their knowledge of algorithmic transparency overall. And we concluded that exercise in a co-design session where they were able to tell us what information they would actually want to see. And um, some of the findings from, from that study were actually really, uh, really key for the development of the standards. So, for example, the, the fact that we currently have two tiers, this is something that we've taken directly from that study because um, that was a suggestion that the members of the public um, posed to us. They essentially said that they wouldn't necessarily want to read all of this information, but they would still like it to be available online. And they suggested that there should be a layered, um, there should be a layered uh, level of information. So they don't have to see all those detailed categories, but they know how to access them if they wanted to. So that was um, one, one way in which this public engagement study informed our work. And also in terms of categories of information that we currently include in the standard, that was also 
um, very much based on, on what we discovered with Britain Thinks and the Centre for Thetatics and Innovation. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Anna. What do you think are the biggest challenges for algorithmic transparency in government? That's an excellent question. Um, I, I think this will probably not surprise anyone, but the challenges are um, mainly in terms of the process and, uh, and in terms of the culture. So I think algorithmic transparency is, um, is a huge project. And in, or in order for it to be successful, we need to understand where exactly algorithms are being used. And I think this, this requires a huge scoping exercise that, uh, that, that we've started doing. But um, it will take a while to, to fully understand um, the scale and scope of that. So I think that's one challenge. Then the second challenge is also introducing that level of transparency as a part of, of the process. Um, as always, government uh, has issues with, with resources. And, um, and, and this is something that we have to keep in mind. Essentially, how do we make algorithmic transparency a part of any any processes related to the, to the deployment of algorithms in the public sector without putting this additional burden on teams. So I'd say that's that's another challenge. Um, also working with suppliers and, um, and and I think when it comes to tools developed in house, this is really straightforward. But um, but there is a there is a whole journey ahead of us in terms of um, trying to to make sure that our suppliers are also able to answer all the questions that we have in the standards. Uh, so these are the main challenges, I would say, but uh, but I can definitely think of a, of a few more. Uh, and I'm sure in the piloting process, we'll probably discover quite a quite a few issues. But uh, we are we are staying optimistic. I think uh, everyone seems to be really enthusiastic about this work and all the colleagues that I've been talking to across government um, believe that this is something that we really need to do and uh, and they're keen to put the resources and time and effort into this work. So, so hopefully this will be a success. Excellent, thanks. We've got about four minutes left, so we've got some time still for other questions. Um, the, the next one is from Sam from Med Confidential. Evening to you, Sam. Um, Sam says the standard looks at process, but to what extent is the notion of a data sheet for data sets useful to know the heritage and data biases of tools built on data sets and discourage bad behaviour by profit focused entities? So I'm not actually sure I understand the question. So I think um, I think part of it is um, whether a, a sort of data sheet which gives you a sense of all of the data sets um, that are being used in a particular algorithm, to what extent that would be useful. Um, sorry, I still don't get it. <laughs> um, so whether it would be useful as part of the standard um, that you can see all of the data sets that are being used by a particular algorithm, so you know the heritage and the biases of any tools that may be built um, on those data sets. Yes, so that's essentially what we're trying to do in the data section. And um, and we're asking people to, to give us details such as what parts of the specific data sets um, have been used and, and how. So essentially what we're trying to do is to get as much detail as possible. And this also includes the, the wider process. So if the data set um, is, is taken from somewhere else, we would like to know what was the original purpose and process of data collection. So we are very much um, aiming to, to track all of that. Excellent, thanks. Um, a question from Sam Roberts, previous uh, Data Bytes presenter. Evening to you, Sam. Um, algorithmic transparency is a hot topic for many of our international colleagues. Have you reached out to any other public sector organisations doing similar work globally? Absolutely. So we've been talking to quite a few different um, governments. So, for example, New York City, um, we've, we've been in touch with them. Um, also, the government of Canada and France, they've been doing some fantastic work. We've also been closely looking at what's happening in the Netherlands and Amsterdam. And I think the um, um, Open Algorithms Network convened by the Open Government Partnership has been extremely useful and helpful in this whole process because it really gave us an opportunity to discuss some of this work with people working on algorithmic transparency around the world. So, so that was another way of engaging with international partners that I've personally found really, really useful. 
Excellent. Uh, the next question is from Dr. Ian Brown. Even to you. Um, he is interested in your view on whether you envisage the future need for a cross-departmental or external validation of the algorithms being developed in government. And in fact, there are quite a few questions that sort of ask about what the enforcement might look like, whether there are teeth um, that sort of sit behind all of this. Excellent question. So I'm afraid at this stage I can't offer any more details, but uh, please rest assured that we are thinking about that. Excellent. And um, another question from Ian, actually. Algorithms are only as good as the decisions they make. Do you believe a more holistic view of decision making process is also needed alongside this focus on algorithmic transparency? Yes, absolutely. And this is precisely why we have an entire section of the standard that focuses on the wider decision making process because I think especially when we're talking about the quote unquote black box algorithms it's really essential to actually provide details on where they sit exactly within the wider policy and decision making process so this is something that we are including in the standard. Excellent. Final 30 seconds. I'm going to squeeze one quick question in. Um, this is from Paul Waller, and it's actually about black boxes as well. Does the transparency requirement imply that public bodies should not buy black box tools or services? So the transparency requirement is all about communicating how those algorithmic tools are being used um, to the public. So, so we, in this particular work, we, we're not actually providing any any specific instructions on, on what to buy and what not to buy. Um, having said that, this is being looked at in different parts of the government. But in this particular work, we're focusing on giving as much detail as possible on what's currently being used. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Natalia. And um, we look forward to hearing how the pilot goes. Great. Thank you very much. So um, thank you to all of you for your um, excellent questions there as well. And sorry for those that I wasn't able to get to. Now, before we get to our second uh, speaker of the evening, you'll be delighted to hear it's time for our next quiz question. So remember to go back to the poll tab on Slido. Hopefully um, it's about to appear on screen and will also appear on your Slido. So question six, what does this chart show? Is it A, people opting out of their health data being shared, B, the average number of COVID tests conducted each day, C, the average number of London underground passengers per day, or D, signatures on a parliamentary petition to require verified IDs to use social media. Your time is very quickly running out. The correct answer is a, it's people opting out of their health data being shared in the wake of the somewhat botched GPDPR reforms earlier this year. So remember, we'll be back with the next question uh, after the next Q&A uh, and our next speaker. And our next speaker is Henry. So over to you, Henry. Thanks a lot, Gavin, and thanks for inviting me here today to speak about the work. Hi, everyone. I'm Henry Dittman from the Bayes Advanced Analytics team, here to tell you about how we've been monitoring the economy using real-time indicators. First, a little bit of background on the team. Advanced Analytics is a multidisciplinary data science team that operates as an internal consultancy covering all of Bayes' key policy areas. Since the start of the pandemic, we've been developing and reporting upon a suite of real-time indicators using alternative data sources. Our RTIs are shared through a cross-government R-Shiny dashboard and feed into a variety of different briefing products. Later on in this presentation, we'll see examples of RTIs that cover business activity, the labour market and mobility. First, though, we should speak about some of the key features of real-time indicators. Of course, the whole purpose of RTIs is to give a peek into what is happening now in a particular policy area. And the way that RTIs enable that is by providing us with high frequency data. Now, when we say high frequency, really what we mean is high frequency in comparison to official data and statistics, which are typically only published monthly, quarterly or even less frequently. In contrast, our RTIs are updated daily or weekly. It is very important to note, however, that RTIs are not a replacement for official data and statistics, which remain the gold standard for robustness and reliability. Another common feature of many RTIs is that they can be volatile and can fluctuate on a day-to-day -day basis. That means it's important to look for signals and trends within your data and to have a strong understanding of what movements within your data are significant and what may just be noise so that you can brief your customers accordingly. Another key consideration is that often RTIs will not be fully um, representative of the policy area within which they operate. 
An excellent example of this would be using online job vacancies as a proxy for the wider labour market. Of course, we're well aware that there will be certain sectors and occupations that do not tend to, cap to advertise their vacancies online. And so these will not be captured within the data set. Again, it's important to put any limitations of your RTI at the core of your product so that users use them responsibly. There's really two key benefits to real-time indicators that make them so powerful. The first is the use of novel data sources to augment official statistics and to shed more light on a particular policy area. The second is their speed in comparison to official statistics. Being published either daily or weekly means that decision makers can use RTIs to monitor the effect of policy interventions or sudden shocks in real time. Combined, these two benefits mean that decision makers can use RTIs to make better, more evidence-based decisions more quickly. When it comes to selecting our real-time indicators, we really have three key criteria that we need to consider. The first is what policy questions are we actually interested in trying to answer? Here are a few that we've considered over the course of the pandemic. How is lockdown affecting sectors? How are people responding to guidance? How have labour markets been impacted? The second key consideration is what official data is out there already? Are there any official data sources it will be useful to augment or enhance with some complementary RTI monitoring? Are there any data sources it would be useful to have a leading indicator of, even if it's less robust than the official stats themselves? Finally, and perhaps most critically, we need to consider what RTI data is actually out there and available for us to use. It's all very well having a policy question you'd like to answer and an official data source that you'd like to enhance with some RTI monitoring, but if the data isn't out there, you're not gonna get very far. So when it comes to selecting real-time indicators, it's generally a balancing act between these three different considerations. Turning now to some examples of some of our RTIs, the first one I'd like to speak about is some of our national footfall data, which is supplied by Springboard and which you may have seen in the ONS's Faster Indicators Bulletin. Springboard measure footfall at a variety of different UK retail locations, including high streets, retail parks and shopping centres. The chart on the right neatly illustrates one of the key takeaways from this data source, which is that footfall at retail parks has held up much better than footfall at either high streets or shopping centres consistently over the course of the pandemic. This data is updated daily and was most useful last year when restrictions were changing rapidly and we wanted to investigate the effect that different combinations of restrictions had on consumer behaviour. The data is also available at a regional level, which has been useful to allow comparisons between regions with different restrictions. For example, when Scotland and Wales had different restrictions to England. We've also used this data to do deep dives into areas of particular concern, such as when there were local lockdowns last year. Alongside our football data, we also make use of a variety of open mobility data, including Google Mobility, Apple Mobility and CityMapper data. We found Google Mobility to be a particularly good complement to our footfall data because Google Mobility splits out its mobility indexes by location type with an index for workplace activity, transit station activity, park activity and more. The chart on the right illustrates one of the key takeaways from this data source, which is that workplace activity in London has fallen more than the wider UK and has remained below the UK average consistently throughout the pandemic. Alongside our open mobility data, we also make use of Google Trends to provide quick insights into consumer in, uh, interests and concerns. Turning now to more business focused RTIs, we've been monitoring the number of restaurant bookings via OpenTable's State of the Industry website since the start of the pandemic. This data was most useful last year during the Eat Out to Help Out scheme. If you look at the chart on the top right, you'll see the first peak there corresponds with the peak of the Eat Out to Help Out scheme, when at its height there were more than 50% more restaurant reservations than the same time in 2019. One caveat that it's very important to note with this data, however, is that it only includes the effects of online reservations, phone reservations and walk-ins. Takeaways do not factor into any of these numbers. Again, it's very important to highlight any limitations of your data to your customers so that, they, uh, so that you can ensure that they draw appropriate conclusions from them. The final RTI that I'd like to discuss today is some of our online job vacancy data, which is supplied by Burning Glass Technologies. Burning Glass web scrape a variety of different online job vacancy boards and provide us with data such as the full text, title, salary information, location and more for each job listing. From this, we're able to aggregate up to build indexes of the number of job vacancies by region, sector, occupation and so on. 
Alongside this, we also receive additional variables of interest, such as the uh, percentage of adverts offering the option to work from home, which is shown on the right. As you can see from the light blue and the pink lines, the proportion of adverts offering home working opportunities remains well above the pre-pandemic baseline of 1-2%, to shown as the darker blue at the bottom of the graph. This data is updated daily, providing us with dynamic insights into the labour market. In conclusion, RTIs are novel data sources that provide much higher frequency updates than official statistics, but which are less robust and are not a replacement for official stats, which remain the gold standard. It's very important to understand the limitations of each RTI data source and to communicate them to customers as a core part of your product to ensure that the data is not misused. RTIs are often volatile and can fluctuate on a day-to-day -day basis, so you should look for signals and trends within them and ensure you have a strong understanding of what movements are significant. Finally, RTIs enable policymakers to monitor the effects of policy interventions or sudden changes and help support them in making quicker, better, evidence-based decisions. I'd now be very happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you very much indeed, Henry. Um, and as Henry says, if you would like to ask uh, him a question, and plenty of you already are, uh, you can do so using Slido. Please go to the Q&A tab rather than the poll tab, uh, where we'll have another quiz question shortly. Um, so thank you very much for that, Henry. Um, again, we've got lots of questions coming in already. I'll start with one from Anonymous. Um, is reliance on data procured from private profit-making organisations appropriate for government and how are potential biases within those data sets mitigated? It's an excellent question. Um, I suppose when you're moving within quite a fast policy context such as the coronavirus pandemic there's a need to procure data quickly and I think you're certainly right to highlight those types of concerns. I think there's always a balancing act however between uh, the good that that data can do when it's actually put into people's hands. Um, in terms of how we actually uh, kind of scrutinise our data and look for biases, we're always very keen to compare with other data sources that are out there. Um, so an excellent example of that would be we use Burning Glass for our online job vacancy data, but we pay very close attention to the ONS's at Zuna data, um, which is effectively the same thing from a different provider. So we're always cross-checking between different data sources to make sure um, that our data is consistent with the wider picture. Excellent, thanks. Um, a question from another question from Anonymous. It might be a different Anonymous, who knows? How do you measure the impact from real time insights? What does good look like? Really good question. So, um, the way our RTIs work broadly is that they tend to feed into other briefing products from other teams. So, we treat our RTIs as effectively a central repository that other teams can then come in and borrow from. I think it's really critical to, to note that RTI should never form the sole or the main basis of your decision making progress and that's not how we see them. They're meant to feed into a broader picture alongside all the more traditional analysis that the civil service and the government provides. So they're just one extra faster moving bit of the picture um, would be my, my view on that. Thanks. Uh, we've got a question now from Colin. Evening to you. Do you use RTIs of sentiment, say from social media sources? Um, if so, are they useful or perhaps misleading? And if not, might they be useful or misleading? Excellent question. So it's not something that we've done so much as a core part of the RTIs, but it is something my team looks at quite extensively. The issues with sentiment analysis is that it's pretty hard to train a good model. Um, and there's a variety of different reasons for that. So probably the easiest one to illustrate is that sentiment analysis is really bad at picking up things like sarcasm. It's really hard to tell whether someone is saying a particular politician is great and means it or if they're actually saying the complete opposite. So in general, we haven't looked at that too much because it requires quite a lot of knowledge of the data and quite a lot of fine tuning to get a good model out. And we'd never be quite sure we could be confident enough for, we, for us to want people to make decisions based on that but it is something that we look at and do use in other projects at times. Great thank you. Uh, Graham asks a lot of these indicators relate to economic activity and labour markets what scope if any is there for using faster indicators in other policy areas? Yeah, this is a brilliant question. So as I said at the start, we really set up the RTIs in response to the coronavirus pandemic. We have also applied them in other policy areas such as EU transition and so on. But having seen the power of the RTIs and what they can do, we are now starting to take a broader and longer term view of particularly Bayes' key priorities. So we are investigating where we might be able to provide more value in other policy areas outside of the business and economy focused ones. Excellent. Uh, person, evening to you, Person, uh, asks, um, these RTIs look really interesting. Are you able to give any indication of how or whether this is impacted on policy rather than just measuring effects? 
Yeah, it's a complicated question, partly due to our delivery, sir, uh, the way we actually deliver these RTIs. So as I said, many teams tend to pull our RTIs out of our dashboard and use them in their own briefing products. So we are not necessarily in the room when our RTIs are being communicated to senior officials or ministers, but we do know that they uh, they form extensive parts of the pictures that various um, policy officials use to, to brief them. So I couldn't say directly where they fed into um, particular decisions, but I know they will have been um, seen across various different uh, government departments when it comes to decisions around, for example, how much ro uh, restrictions have affected uh, mobility and things like that. Excellent. And a not unrelated question from Peter Wells. Evening to you, Peter. Are the reports published openly and or made available to public bodies outside central government? No, so our RTI platform is only available to government departments um, and that's just due to some restrictions with some of our data partners who don't want us sharing those more widely. Um, so the RTIs I've shown today are more or less the full extent of the open source ones that I'm allowed to share with the general public. Um, can you give us a sense of, of how many uh, we might be talking about altogether, just as a, a general? Yeah, so we probably have another six or seven different data sets that are in regular use, but we do a variety of different things with those. There'd be obviously a lot more than one chart for each one of those. So there's quite a lot that you're not seeing. Certainly, I'd say you're only seeing a, min a minority of sort of the work that we've done so far here, as a lot of it is just restricted. Excellent. Um, we've got about three minutes left. So there is time for more questions if you want to submit them. Uh, person asks, how do you compensate for the higher frequency data being potentially less robust? Really good question. I think that probably comes back to something that I've, I've stressed throughout the presentation is that you have to have a really strong understanding of any limitations of your data set and what movements are actually significant within it. Um, I think really that that has to be handled in a number of different ways. So it can be even as simple as not briefing on a particular movement in a data source until you've got a few more days worth of data and you're sure that the movement you're seeing actually reflects underlying changes and isn't just noise within the data. Um, so I'd say there isn't really one, one answer for that. It needs to be um, kind of an experienced data analysis, taking a look at the data first and seeing whether they're actually happy to send that out into the wider world for people to draw conclusions. So we're in regular contact with all our key stakeholders and they often come back to ask us questions um, about whether our data is actually showing what they think it might be showing. So that's generally how we handle those sorts of issues. Thanks. A different anonymous, thank you for that, um, asks, how do you account for the population in policymaking who are never shown in these metrics that all come from digital sources? Uh, sorry, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, so given a lot of the um, things that you've shown us sort of comes from uh, digital sources, you mentioned Open Table, for instance, how do you account for those members of the population who won't show up because they're not online or they don't have access to, to those things? Yeah, really good question. So again, I think it comes back to clearly communicating any limitations of your data sources to your customers. Um, so we're well aware that certain data sources in our platform, for example, might skew towards particular areas of the population due to where they come from. So they might favour uh, younger people or older people or people of particular demographics and so on. I think it comes back again to making that a core part of the RTI product. When you are briefing about these changes that you're seeing in a particular RTI, you need to make sure the limitations are there and clear and stress that say, you know, this RTI is showing X, Y, Z, but we should note that it is mostly focused on younger people and so will not have picked up on changes due to, say, older people being more vaccinated now and so on. So that's the way we handle that. Excellent. And we've got another uh, transparency related question from Anonymous. If these RTIs are being used for briefings, is there enough transparency and openness when ministers provide answers to the House or during a press interview? Um, I'm not sure I'm actually really qualified to answer that question, to be honest. I'm not sure I can give you a good answer for that. No problem. Um, we've got about 40 seconds left. So um, a final one from me. Um, our first ever uh, Data Bytes presentation back in April 2019 was about the FASTA economic indicators from the ONS. To what extent have you been working with other parts of government um, on developing these? And what, what, what's the sort of trend at the moment for, for people using them? Yeah, there's a lot of interest in RTIs across government from a lot of different sources. We're very well linked up with the ONS. In fact, some of our data, such as the footfall data that I've shown you there, was a joint procurement. Um, and we regularly collaborate with them. We're in regular contact most weeks about various briefings with them. Um, more widely, we feed into a variety of different working groups um, that look at various RTI related products. So we have a really strong network of contacts of um, other colleagues who are doing brilliant work across the civil service in a similar space. Excellent. Well, Henry, that's been absolutely fascinating. I think that may be a new record for the number of questions we've got through in eight minutes as well. And I'm sure we could have got through a lot more. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much for inviting me.
Our pleasure. Um, so before we get to our next uh, set of speakers, it is, of course, time for our next quiz question. So remember to go back to the poll tab on Slido. Hopefully that is appearing any moment now. So question seven. This chart shows the word counts of various publications. But what was the word count of the government consultation data a new direction? Was it A, 63,766 words, B, 60,906 words, C, 59,796 words, or D, 50,548 words? Register your answers now as time is running out. The correct answer, data a new direction, was B, nearly 61,000 words long, longer than Lord of the Flies or War of the Worlds, among many other great works of literature. And I shudder to think how many thousands of words DCMS have had in response. So we now go to our third presentation of the evening. Over to Mallory and Ben. Thanks so much, Gavin. Hi, I'm Mallory. Hey, I'm, I'm Ben, and we wanted to come and speak to you. And this is particularly aimed at kind of data scientists working in the public sector, but obviously kind of everyone um, uh, really welcome to listen. And uh, Mallory and I have been working in government kind of the last few years in various different data science teams. And we thought we'd just talk through three examples that we found really effective um, and kind of three different types of tools, um, really focusing on kind of a product um, so you kind of use situational awareness tools, like what the ground truth actually is in the world, the analytical tools, so like how can you explore the data really quickly before you do much more complex analyses like ML, and then your kind of decision tools, so how can you create the perfect tool for a particular instance so that uh, that decision can be as evidence-based as possible. Um, so I think Mary's going to kick us off. Awesome. Thanks, Ben. Um, the first type of product we wanted to talk about was situational awareness, which um, lots of teams across government do an excellent job of, for example, the base team that, that you've just heard from. Um, but if you tuned into the cabinet secretary's speech back in October, uh, or maybe uh, a talk here on Monday, you might have heard uh, stories about the journey on uh, crisis response and a movement from crisis response slide packs to sort of online or digital tools for displaying data. Um, this has been a particular journey for Ben and I, who descended into a bunker in sort of February, March of 2020, never to see the light of day again, um, to kind of really focus on how we could move from um, initial crisis response where departments fed into a slide pack that then had to be emailed to decision makers, printed out, couldn't be updated, um, you know, with, with as great sort of speed or frequency, um, and really starting to move toward situational awareness digital tools. Um, I think our best example of this is obviously the coronavirus dashboard. Uh, shout out to Public Health England and Puria, uh, who are responsible for the, the tool that um, Ben is going to show. But what we did here um, was move from this sort of static product to um, pulling data into a dashboard that all decision makers could access uh, rather than sort of emails or printouts at the click of a button to create a commonly shared information picture um, that could be updated as and when new data became available. We also found massive benefits to this um, from being able to make our analytical pipelines reproducible, um, speeding up the process of quality assurance and validation, and finally gave us the ability to um, really get decision makers using and thinking about their data um, in the sort of context of regular conversation. So for example, here you've got information on vaccination. You might be in a meeting talking about this and you know the prime minister or someone else could ask a question about what vaccination has meant for case rates this week or hospitalizations. And instead of sort of flipping through a slide pack to try to find the right information, you can quite easily navigate, make it a really fluid process. Um, what Ben and I found from this um, is it, on top of just making information more accessible, it made it a more regular part of conversation. Um, so as much time as we've ever spent forecasting things, we never could have predicted senior decision makers going so far beyond looking at a trend or glancing at a chart to asking us questions like, does our data fit a Gaussian curve? Um, and, and really being excited about the ways in which having information in an interactive format, even if it's really simple information, um, has really taken the data conversation further and allowed us to do uh, stuff like what Ben will dive into now. 
Yeah, no, and I think just as a like part of the kind of product tips, I think our big tip when using situation awareness tools would be um, if your kind of decision maker can't understand the message in 10 seconds or less, you probably need to simplify it even more. Um, and But there's a kind of other category of tool where you can afford a bit more complexity. So I've, I've deliberately just screenshotted a slightly impenetrable CSV here, um, which um, we've just bashed up a, a really ba a very, very basic um, kind of front end to just to just to show you kind of the difference between staring at this CSV and then we've kind of got this IFG mock up uh, for you where you can see the same sort of data, but just presented in a slightly more uh, a slightly more interactive way. Um, and it's all about how do you like reduce that analysis lag? So clearly this isn't anything you'd use as a finished product, right? It's like still horrifically um, kind of complex, um, but like this this sort of metric explorer can just allow you a really quick way of understanding data um, after you've um, kind of looked at the CSVs a bit and you can just mash them together and to get a real sense of kind of what is the data sharing before you go off and do you know some big machine learning analysis or some other form of analysis and uh we reason we wanted to do an example for you um is just to show you know this literally is kind of 25 minutes um of of kind of data wrangling and then like an hour of plotly uh, in python and, and deployment and, and if that all sounds like gobbledygook to you but you still want to do it uh, and, and you work in the public sector as a data scientist, email me afterwards and, and you know, we can share the code with you and, and kind of show you how to build these sorts of things really quickly. And then you can kind of have interactive maps. You can, uh, you know, go in and, and, and see uh, really, really like dynamically kind of what's going on before you get in and kind of do that more complex analysis. And uh, yeah, we have the kind of code repositories um, that we're able uh, to share with you if you are kind of uh, working uh, in a in a kind of government department, and then there's the much more complicated, um, well, not complicated, but slightly different type of tool, uh, which is like the decision tool, uh, which always feels a bit more uh, kind of uh, it's just you put so much work in, it's just like uh, kind of used for thirty minutes, um, uh, but obviously a really important thirty minutes. And uh, the kind of point of these is you're trying to. Uh, you know the two page note is a wonderful thing and it's been used to drive decisions for millennia and it's excellent and it's still excellent for you know almost everything and then there's the occasional really data heavy decision where in addition to that uh, having a tool that has a huge amount of explanatory power where in the room you can drill into exactly what the answer is to something and the decision maker doesn't have to say in three weeks can you find out this you can just find it out instantaneously in the room uh, can really add a bit and then Mallory and I have, have built various different types that we can kind of uh, uh, talk about offline uh, with, with government colleagues if that's of interest. Um, but but our top tip with those would be just tailor them to the user, kind of, at, and and like the, there's no such thing as kind of spending too long on on kind of uh, getting those because because if you can reduce that, if you can make data genuinely fun, um, then it and then it really does get used all the time and and it, it really does breathe through. Um, but Mallory, you were going to finish us off with some much more sensible reflections about kind of uh, how how you, people can apply this in their everyday lives. Thank you. Uh, nailed it on the segue there, Ben. So I, to sort of sum up, uh, Ben and I have obviously been sort of on a learning journey with this alongside the rest of government. Um, and our sort of set of top tips are definitely around user centered design, you know, not building the most complex beautiful product um, if it doesn't suit the needs of the customer um, or the context you're designing in. Um, not settling for second best, so always kind of aiming high, going for API first, always having the best data sharing standards in place because it's all too easy to sort of fall back on um, what works really quickly or is kind of scrappy and easy to do, but so much harder to kind of get the world moving out of that place. So really aiming high and going for uh, best practice immediately. Um, and then finally, as much as Ben and I love them, uh, dashboards are not the be all and end all. Uh, it's one extra tool in our toolbox that we think has been a really fun, engaging way to really open up the data conversation and bring people in. Um, but certainly on sort of products and tools, this is an evolution, not a revolution to steal uh, Ben's lovely phrase. Uh, happy to take questions. Gavin, back over to you. 
Thank you both very much indeed. Top tips and a typology, I think, of, of government dashboards there. Um, to everybody watching, uh, you can, of course, ask your questions via Slido using the Q&A tab. We've got some coming in already. Um, so I'll start with um, some of the ones that we've already had. Um, Anonymous uh, says the COVID-19 dashboard is excellent. What was the design process like behind the data visualisations? I can imagine it's challenging to make these critical metrics accessible. Awesome, maybe I'll take this one. Um, I'm going to say it was iterative and is iterative. So design process being very much testing and trial um, and changing and evolving things over time as metrics and indicators you know, improved or changed, um, but also the understanding of the customer base did as well. And I think that's sort of the key core principle of things that have been successful in various dashboards is just ability and willingness to change over time and not get stuck in, well, we did it this way first, and this is where we're going to be forever. And that's sort of a real added benefit of digital tools is just that ability to continue iterating. And I don't think you need to just take our word, right? John Murdoch on Monday from the FD was saying, you know, the UK government's been particularly good at, well, maybe I'm paraphrasing optimistically here, but I, th I think he said something like the UK government's been particularly good at um, actually adding new metrics to the dashboard and really trying to make sure that um, users outside of government get, get as much from it as possible as well. And you can watch, anybody watching at home, you can watch that event uh, from Monday on the IFG website. Um, just picking up something that you said there, Mallory, about the sort of different customer bases. How different is it when your sort of main users are the public versus when your main users are politicians and senior decision makers? I'll start and then hand over to Ben. Um, I don't know that there's one good answer to that um, because we have lots of different customers within the public um, as well as within decision makers who have varying amount of time to engage with varying amounts of information to try to make different kinds of decisions. So, you know, I imagine that there's a whole crowd, maybe all of them on this call, um, who use the COVID dashboard to make their own decisions about their own safety and the safety of their family members. Um, and that's not massively different, um, you know, than, than government decision makers kind of looking at this information. Um, um, but I think really thinking about the time someone has to to input into consuming the information um, and what that means for how you highlight key messages would be my sort of uh, fallback answer for that. Ben, do you have anything to add? Just like a tip, like get these things out really quickly and and, and let people tell you what they don't like. You know, I think Doug, uh, you know, said this when he was at Amazon, like, everything you think is going to land really well with people never does and it's the stuff that you kind of uh, you know it's the stuff that you didn't really expect that people love and it's just like you're not going to discover that except by iterative product development and the only way and if you spend three months developing something and then share it you're going to be super entrenched in your views about it so like we really do try and launch products in hours and days um just so we can start that cycle going and and that would kind of and, and you're welcome you know kind of public sector employees on this call are welcome to to use our kind of existing code repositories to help leapfrog that process for them uh, great thank you and um, we've got a question from jay good evening to you when will what you do become the norm i mean i think it is the norm um, within within government, I think um, you know clearly that's like a loaded question. Right? It kind of assumes that it's not the norm right now, and you know I'm super happy to like take it offline with with this Jay and just you know kind of chat through kind of why we think it's why we think it is the norm and 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 wherever it currently is, you know the offers there they can replicate from the cookie cutter and, and repository and kind of get going. Uh, sorry, slightly predictable answer, but <laughs> nonetheless. Great. Um, Anonymous asks, what alternatives to dashboards are you exploring? OK, I'll, I'll take it. Um, the, so I think dashboards are really just one extra tool, right? So if you're not doing traditional analysis well, if you uh, and so, you know, at the start of any any product that we developed, over the last few years, we've thought, you know, what is the exact question we're trying to answer? Constantly test that with the people who you think you're answering it for, and then just, you know, pivot as you go. Um, sometimes it genuinely is appropriate to do some monster ML analysis, like machine learning analysis, um, that doesn't need a dashboard. And you actually might do a huge amount of work, and then it comes out as one killer stat. So, uh, you know, there's, um, there's a line in the public domain from uh, Gave's speech in the Ditchy Lecture last year, 
and uh, that project took 16 weeks um, to do and it is one stat in that lecture right but it's it's so like it's so important to find the truth out that it was worth doing that that was the best way to communicate um, that whole project um, so I think it's just about not thinking that just because you put loads of blood sweat and tears in it it needs to be a massive tome um, it's just whatever's most effective with the audience I, I know we all know that and it, it's kind of obvious but it, you know it doesn't mean we all do it all the time so worth repeating I suspect there are a lot of audience members currently nodding quite vigorously uh, in response to that. Um, our next question is from Peter Wells again. Um, how are the dashboards archived for the public record or for our future historians, if you like to think in terms of users? Yeah, I mean, so, so they, you know, all of the dashboards code exists and, um, you know, we archive in accordance with the standard procedures of the organization we work for. Um, so there's kind of, you know, we wouldn't be here if we were some shady, um, shady folk who uh, lived in a pasty. And like, I think hopefully the, the very fact that we're here sh sh showing that these things exist um, shows that, you know, we, we kind of follow best procedure and we didn't want to kind of go into all, but obviously we have huge ethical parameters that we work with every day. And uh, we spend our life kind of making sure that every project we do is, is very closely uh, monitored um, and recorded like that. Excellent. Must be must be a challenge to archive things which are, are changing so much in terms of metrics. Sorry, is that a question, Gavin? Um, I mean, not really, right? It's it's digital, so everything is very easy to very easy to archive. I mean, beauty of doing code based analysis as well. Um, easier to work from. You know, someone might you know ten years ago might have been changing a single cell in an excel sheet um which now we can just kind of monitor and record in a slightly different way yeah and same with quality assurance so we're just able to code review and with you know loads the, the lovely thing about a modern product is you can have well we, you could we don't have but you could have literally hundreds of people working on the same product and it would work fine whereas you can't do that in a traditional excel analysis or at least if you can you're very very good at excel the collaboration and uh, much better than i Excellent. Your SharePoint runs faster than mine. <laughs> um, we've got just under a minute left, so this might be the final question. It's from Sam from Med Confidential, um, who notes that there are certain uh, bodies uh, such as uh, DHSC, which may have a reputation for picking metrics to suit the message and limit the ability to dig down and check the details. To what extent have you had warring dashboards or metrics in your work, uh, sort of conflicting results coming from different places? Yeah, I honestly can't think of an example of where that's happened. Um, I think every, I know it's maybe a shock to everyone, but everybody is just trying a really, really difficult job of trying to select the most appropriate metri metrics. And inevitably, if you have lots of different people and you have the great neurodiversity that government does, that's sometimes going to lead to different metrics. And then that's that's a great opportunity to have that discussion about why and then kind of think about what the best metrics are. But but Mallory spends much more time thinking about metrics than me. So you probably have another much more sensible view on this. No, I actually think this is one of my favorite things about the existence of dashboards is that we can sort of much more easily and much more quickly share some of this work, which means that if two different teams are thinking about a piece of analysis or a particular measure in a specific way, um, this has increased sort of speed of transparency. Um, and, you know, we share our work back to the Department for Health or whoever it is and, and vice versa. Um, and I think just sort of that consistent iteration, as Ben says, you know, pushing things out as quickly as we possibly can has meant that you don't end up in a place where two teams trying to do the best work they possibly can just thought about things in a different way, leading to slightly different outcomes. I think it's opened up speed of collaboration um, and I think dashboards are absolutely brilliant for that and uh, you know it doesn't need to be one dashboard to rule them all uh, there's like lots of space for people to be developing products and I think it makes all of our work stronger and better allows for challenge against you know metric selection um, and all of that so I think actually it's been a really super positive thing um, and and warring dashboards only in the sense of like consistently making each other better <laughs> Excellent. Well, that's been absolutely fascinating. I'm sorry we haven't got longer because there are lots more excellent questions to put to you. But Ben, Mallory, thank you very much indeed. Thanks, everyone. Uh, now, before we get to our final speaker of the night, 
we have, of course, our final quiz question. So remember to go back to the poll tab on your Slido. Uh, hopefully that is coming up on screen and is about to come up on Slido as we turn to question eight. When it comes to baby names in England and Wales, which is the third most popular of all cabinet ministers' names, which is the purple line on the chart you can hopefully see? Is it A, Elizabeth, B, Jacob, C, Michelle, or D, David? The third most popular of all cabinet ministers' names when it comes to baby names in England and Wales. Elizabeth, Jacob, Michelle, or David? Your time is rapidly running out if it hasn't already done so. The correct answer, the third most popular uh, baby name amongst all cabinet ministers' names is B, Jacob. So that's it uh, for the quiz questions. Um, so remember to go back to the Q&A tab uh, to put your questions to our next speaker, Michael. Over to you. Thank you, Gavin. Um, a real honour to be back and to be marking so many milestones. Um, and with a sneak peek at an early Christmas gift, you'll all no doubt be eagerly unwrapping uh, when CDI publishes later this month. Um, so the AI Barometer is a research report looking at the opportunities and risks around AI and data-driven technology use and the barriers to responsible innovation that hold us back from maximising its benefits. Um, in our first edition last year, we looked at five sectors, and this second edition looks at applications in a further three sectors, employment and workforce management, transport and logistics, and education. Um, and the report also contains the results of a business innovation survey that CDI conducted with around 1,000 organizations, which has some uh, fascinating findings around the adoption, use, and attitudes towards data-driven tech. So there's a lot of content in there, um, and with my eight minutes, I'm only going to try and take you through uh, some of the key findings of our cross-sector chapter and give you a flavour of what you might find elsewhere. Um, before I start on findings, a little bit on our approach. So it's focused on the positive and negative impacts of data-driven technology use, and which we refer to quite broadly. And throughout the report, we use the kind of quadrant you see here on the right to highlight areas that probably demand the greatest attention from policymakers, developers, and users of tech. Um, and we, we chose these sectors as ones that had been severely impacted by the pandemic and uh, where technology could hold the keys to recovery. So we wanted to look at what might hold us back from making the most uh, uh, of technology in those sectors. Um, and as well as a lot of desk research, the findings are fundamentally driven by expert engagement. So for each sector, we convened panels of representatives from government, regulators, industry, academia, civil society, and so on. And we used comparative survey tools to, um, uh, to so that those panels could meaningfully assess and rank a, a large number of technological impacts, which helped us to build the quadrants and, and which we used the results of to, to provoke discussion in a series of workshops. So on to our findings. The, the idea at the heart of the report is that there are a huge number of promising applications for these technologies, but the opportunities they offer aren't necessarily equal. Some are easier to achieve and are likely to occur anyway, and, and some hold greater transformative potential than others. And you can see here, um, how that promise manifests across the sectors that we looked at. So in terms of those opportunities uh, with the greatest potential, we're talking about use cases such as system level applications to reduce carbon emissions, scaling up the provision of high quality education or improving fairness in recruitment and management contexts. And the report finds that many of those most promising opportunities are also amongst the hardest to achieve. And there are some patterns to the types of use cases that tend to be easier or harder to achieve. So if automation of a process doesn't really have a direct or large impact on individuals or where you're adding in data driven insights to existing human decision making, our panel generally rank those as easier to achieve. But when you're trying to transform existing human decision making systems into ones more directly driven by automated systems, that's more challenging, be that long term planning or qualitative judgments about human performance. And using data-driven technologies uh, or approaches to, to actually reduce uh, bias or discrimination in real-world processes does remain challenging with, with relatively few live examples of this actually happening. Um, another area we look at in the report are the risks presented by these technologies, which is an important part of understanding how, can, uh, how we can maximise the benefits of that technology. So we tested a pretty broad and varied collection of these with our panel. So they are a mix of aggravating factors, so a lack of explainability, for example, um, and later stage impacts, such as uh, a loss of trust in AI or the institutions using such technologies. 
Um, and as with last year, the way that these manifests can vary a lot by sector and even uh, between use cases within sectors. Many of these will be familiar to those working in the field, but our findings do give a sense of the most prominent concerns raised by our panels that were common across all sectors we looked at and what policymakers, developers and users may want to prioritise in terms of mitigation. So having looked at what the prize is in these sectors um, and the risks that we need to manage, we conclude by highlighting the major cross-sectoral barriers that hold us back from realising that prize. So this is really the punchline of the report. Um, these barriers included low trust in data-driven technology, which is often driven by unmitigated risks. So our panel highlighted a number of instances in recent years where that low trust has tangibly inhibited innovation or the potential of particular use cases by reducing people's willingness to share data or those systems or driving organizational reluctance to use data-driven technology for fear of backlash. Um, unclear governance, particularly in terms of the application and overlaps between different legal frameworks like data protection and equality law to some really very specific contexts. One particularly striking observation by a panel member uh, that develops data-driven technology was how the absence of specific guidance for their context sometimes requires them to become detectives in case law uh, with implications on how they can innovate. Um, misaligned market incentives and poor market information. So this is the question of whether developers in some contexts are really incentivized to develop products that meet user needs, for example, those of educators, and how easy it is for both vendors and users to navigate that market of data stream technologies and find what they're really looking for. Um, this point about scientific validity. So here we're talking about the real world use of new data driven metrics that sort of purport to be measuring concepts like performance or productivity or engagement, um, for example, of staff, but where the validity of those metrics as sort of accurate measures of those concepts is not necessarily proven and how that can drive uh, low trust. And then lastly, sort of low digital and data maturity. So here we don't just mean access to the technology itself, but organizations not yet having comprehensive processes for how they handle data beyond basic legal compliance and not yet integrating the outputs and insights of data-driven tools properly into their processes. Um, so for example, in how they recruit or manage staff, um, what one member just panel, uh, sorry, what one panel member described as um, being stuck in pre-AI workflows. So, those are the headlines of the report, but there's a lot more sitting underneath it. I can really recommend having a browse of the business innovation survey, uh, which we conducted with Ipsos Mori. We'll be publishing both the full survey report and a summary as part of the barometer chapters. And these look at key trends around the adoption of data driven technologies among UK businesses. You can see a tantalizing glimpse of the findings there on the right, but to give you a uh, taster, um, it looks at how barriers to adoption vary at different points in a firm's technology adoption life cycle. Um, and these include things like uncertainty over the value of the technologies, low digital maturity, resource constraints and regulatory uncertainty, really mirroring a lot of uh, our panel findings. And you'll also find um, detailed sector chapters covering opportunities, risks and barriers across each of the sectors. And I'm pleased to report that Overall, in comparison to the national data strategy, it's a mere 17,000 words in total. Um, but where, when we publish it, it will be broken up into very manageable chunks so you can dive into whatever you might be interested in. Um, so this research isn't necessarily CDI's bread and butter. We're more about working with partners to try and make responsible innovation happen in practice and learning about what that involves. Um, and in terms of the areas we looked at in this report, we have ongoing work around the use of um, recruitment tools and with the Centre uh, for Connected on Autonomous Vehicles about sort of um, AVs and the future of AVs. And we're also supporting our DCMS colleagues work on uh, data reform and the AI strategy. Um, more broadly, uh, we're prioritising three themes this year in our work, um, data sharing, public sector innovation and AI assurance. And um, those are quite broadly drawn. And we're really interested in working with partners, particularly across the public sector in delivering these. So if this has piqued your interest, um, please do get in touch with me at, at this email or, or um, if you if you miss this, then do ask uh, do ask Gavin for it. Um, so that's all I had to say. Um, we hope you enjoy the barometer uh, and when we when we publish it in a couple of weeks time. Thank you very much indeed for the sneak preview, Michael, and congratulations on your Data Bytes hat trick, uh, the first person ever ever to reach that. Um, just a reminder to everybody watching, you can of course use Slido to put your questions to Michael, uh, just make sure you're on the Q&A tab rather than the polling one. Um, so a question from, from me first of all, um, you sort of mentioned this isn't necessarily CDI's bread and butter. What does CDI want to 
do with the barometer? What does it want to see change in the world as, as a result of its findings? So I think um, primarily this is sort of, you know, this is targeted primarily at policymakers, but also at developers and users of technology. One of the things it tries to do is give us a sense of relative importance. So there is, um, there are a lot of, there's a lot of hype around AI and data use. There's a lot of, um, uh, you know, a myriad of different issues. And this this is a, a pretty big research challenge, actually, in terms of trying to understand what, what what's important. So what we're trying to give here is a sense of like, um, where is action needed to make some of these most promising opportunities happen? What do you really, really need to mitigate in order to sort of make sure that these systems are, are trustworthy? And then more broadly zooming out, looking at these barriers and identifying concretely if, if you're a policymaker or or you're working in, in, in the sector, what is it that you need to focus on um, in order to, to sort of, uh, m for us all to benefit from the sort of the, what these technologies can offer and sort of try and clear away some of the, the noise that is inevitably part of public debate around these issues. Excellent, thanks. Um, we've got a question from Tom, which I think goes to some of those wider interests you mentioned that CD CDI has. Are you reviewing locally developed models for data sharing, he asks. Um, that's a good question. So um, we have certainly, we've already published some work um, where we're working, we've worked with a number of local authorities, uh, I believe, including um, Bristol City Council on um, sort of how, uh, uh, how you um, innovate responsibly in, in a sort of general sense. So sort of providing um, sort of frameworks and tools for local organisations to do this. Um, we do have in the in the sort of medium and longer term um, the the ambition at this stage. I think it's probably the fairest way to put it um, to sort of make some of those um, those sort of findings and tools more more broadly available. Um, uh, another example, you know, it's it's not just about local government, but obviously sort of devolved bodies. Um, we, we've been doing a, a piece of work with um, Police Scotland, um, for example, on on their use of uh, of data. And again, it's something that we'd um, really love to bring to sort of a, a broader audience of, of local bodies, so that that the sort of the impact of that work isn't just necessarily constrained to to sort of those individual organisations. Thanks. So this is um, the second barometer. What's changed the most in how you've approached uh, the barometer, but also in terms of the trends in, in the sort of AI landscape? Um, good question. So uh, I'll, take, I'll take it in two parts. The, the first part, um, I think we wanted to focus a lot more on the barriers um, this time around, and we spent a lot more time with our panels sort of talking about those in detail and, and trying to work out the detail of those, because ultimately, I think I think the last time around we it was a much more exploratory piece where um, we were just trying to find out sort of about about those technologies and what the issues were around them. And this time around, we've tried to be a little bit more focused on what is it that we need to change in order to maximise those benefits. Um, and then in terms of um, sort of things that perhaps came out more strongly this time around or changing the trends, I think um, we are seeing. I think our research picked up in in pretty much all of the uh, well, actually, more in, more in education, and employment, the sort of the use of the real world use of um, of, of data driven tools, models, and that sort of thing, where the um, you know these are being sold and bought in a, in a, in a market where it isn't clear sort of exactly how much development those things have had, um, and where um, particularly sort of buyer the buyers of those te that, that that technology aren't um, aren't able to easily uh, understand whether a product meets their needs, um, where it's sort of the data provenance is of, of the sort of the stuff it was trained on, um, and um, you know how whether it's been audited for algorithmic bias and so on. Um, and that's you know that's something that has informed a uh, sort of tranche of work that the the, the centre is um, working on. As I said, we've got this theme around AI assurance, and we're interested in looking at how can you sort of equip everyone in in, the, in that market to um, uh, to have that information and and incentivize the sort of the developers and vendors of this technology to sort of provide that. 
Thanks. Um, I've got a question from Sam from Med Confidential. Sam notes that there was some controversy in the summer of uh, 2020 around the sort of A-level algorithm, um, since the chair of CDI was also the chair of, of Ofqual. Um, there's also been quite a lot of change at CDI since then, with a, a new board and the, the sort of um, proposals in the national data strategy for the, about the role of CDI. How have processes, culture, um, etc., changed um, since over the last year or so at CDI? Um, so, yes, so we, we have a, a fantastic new board and a fantastic um, uh, new chair and a new executive director. And I think um, the real change over, say, the last six months has been um, a real refocusing around um, the way that we sort of um, design and deliver impact and a real focus around this idea of um, partner projects working directly with partners largely in the public sector. Um, to, uh, as I say, uh, we, we use this term responsible innovation and it is a fairly broad term and lots of people that mean different things by it, but um, essentially understand how you innovate responsibly um, and how you deliver that in practice and, and, and rather than simply doing sort of um, research that's disconnected from a lot of that, really working through what that means in practice with people and working out um, how to be a learning organisation, learn from that and then be able to share that knowledge onwards. Um, so I think I think it's fair to say that that's sort of our renewed um, focus and, and our renewed focus across the three themes that um, um, I've outlined and um, uh, looking forward to sort of publishing a lot more work in that vein in the in the sort of coming months. Excellent. Thanks. This um, next question from Mary Susan Barry actually follows on quite nicely from some of those points. Um, she asks, does the barometer provide any trends or evidence for type of intervention which Her Majesty's government could make to support the use more widely in UK PLC? So I need to be a little bit careful here because the barometer doesn't carry any formal recommendations. It's not it's not that kind of thing. And, and we I think, you know, we, we are effectively part of DCMS, so we're not sort of recommending directly to our colleagues. Um, but what we what what the findings do do is is sort of point to some of those areas um, where action might be taken. And I think um, a lot of the uh, the sort of the messages that come out of that do dovetail very neatly with um, work that the government is already taking. So if you look at um, the sort of the proposals in uh, 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 parts of the data reform consultation, if you look at the AI strategy, a lot of that is about creating uh, a level of regulatory clarity and systems for um, sort of governing um, uh, AI and data-driven technologies that give people in those very specific contexts the sort of the confidence um, and the guidance that they need in order to, to sort of um, feel confident innovating and using data. Um, uh, and I've forgotten the second part of my answer, but no problem. Well, we've got we've got about twenty seconds left. So, in, in the remaining twenty seconds, um, what do you think the third iteration of the barometer will look like? I think that's a very good question. It's something that I am only beginning to think about now. Um, so, I think um, I think what we need to think about as an organisation is um sort of what's what's next in terms of of those barriers so um i think with with eight sectors under our belt we've probably covered a lot of ground in terms of um what the different issues are and i think really um that the so what now is looking at the the sort of the collective uh, cumulative lessons of that research and understanding what we can do about it rather than necessarily um sort of saying we definitely need a third edition it's more about looking at those barriers and understanding what we can do about them Excellent. Well, congratulations on, on completing the second one. We all look uh, forward to being able to dive into it when it's published shortly. And thank you very much again, Michael, for, for another, uh, your third excellent presentation at Databyte. So thank you. Thanks a lot, Gavin. So all that uh, remains uh, for me to, to say now, um, before we get on to some parish notices, first of all, to tell you how the quiz went. Um, congratulations to Edward McCarthy, who got seven out of eight questions right. Very well done. The next person, the person in second place, had four out of eight. So particularly impressive performance from Edward. Um, the first thing to say is, of course, uh, we will be having some virtual drinks um, as soon as we finish here. Um, hopefully the details are on screen, but the link is bit.ly slash DB25 drinks with the password IFGDB25. There have been lots of events on at IFG at the moment. We've uh, touched on a few of them uh, tonight, including the one uh, that looks at shocks and crises and how data can deliver for government. You can see a recording of that on the IFG website. And one's coming up over the next couple of weeks, cover everything from Afghanistan to government priorities, including levelling up.
Um, as I mentioned, we are looking for speakers and for sponsors for next year. Uh, so please do get in touch if you'd be interested in speaking or sponsoring, as we can only keep the series going um, with uh, support from sponsors. So all that remains for me to say this evening are some very big thank yous. First of all, um, it's been a fantastic year for, for Databytes, 10 uh, really great events. So a big thank you to everyone at IFG who's made it such a brilliant year, particularly Pratesh, Magnus and Neil. Um, a big thank you to all of you for coming along tonight with some absolutely fantastic questions and, and also for all of your support throughout the year. And of course, a very big thank you to our five fantastic speakers for four excellent presentations this evening. A wonderful way to tie off the Databytes year. All that remains for me to say is have a very Merry Christmas, a happy and healthy New Year, and we'll see you on Wednesday, the 2nd of February 2022 for Databytes 26. Good night. <laughs>